On this trip through the digestive system, we study motility, which is the action of muscles of the GI tract that mix and propel its contents from the mouth to the anus. Your goals for learning are to describe the type of motility found in each part of the GI tract, to associate each type of motility with its functions, to explain the control of motility in each part of the GI tract. Here's what you need to know. The anatomy of the larynx, the anatomical structure of unitary smooth muscle and how it is innervated, how the phenomenon of plasticity in smooth muscle affects its function. To see definitions of terms, click the bold red words. This is the first of three trips that we will make through the GI tract. On this trip, we will study motility and its control. The mouth receives food into the GI tract. Chewing tears and grinds food, reducing lumps to a size that can be swallowed. Chewing also mixes ingested food with saliva, moistening it enough to be easily swallowed. Click the mouth to observe chewing. Chewing is part voluntary and part reflex. The pattern and rhythm of chewing are set by the cortex and brain stem centers. Pressure of food in the mouth elicits reflex chewing actions. In summary, the type of motility in the mouth is chewing. The function of chewing is to mechanically break down food particles and mix the food with saliva. The esophagus serves no digestive or absorptive functions. It is simply a conduit between the pharynx and stomach. Motility in the esophagus is peristalsis, a progressive wave of muscle contractions. In the esophagus and throughout the GI tract, movement of the contents is accomplished by creating a pressure gradient as muscle contracts. Swallowing initiates primary peristalsis in the esophagus. Once begun, Swallowing is a well-coordinated, stereotyped reflex controlled by the swallowing center in the brain stem. Click the esophagus to observe peristalsis. A bolus of food is separated from the contents in the mouth by placing the tip of the tongue against the hard palate. The soft palate rises to close the nasopharynx, preventing the contents of the mouth from entering the nasal passageways. As the tongue moves backward, the bolus is propelled into the oropharynx. Respiration is briefly inhibited, the larynx is elevated, and the glottis closes, which prevents food from entering the trachea. The epiglottis falls to cover the closed glottis. Muscles of the pharynx contract sequentially in peristaltic fashion. The bolus enters the esophagus. As primary peristalsis begins in the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter and proximal body of the stomach relax. The peristaltic wave is propagated by sequential activation of the muscles of the esophagus. As the bolus of food progresses, the larynx, tongue, and soft palate revert to their original positions and respiration resumes. The bolus enters the stomach and the lower esophageal sphincter closes, preventing regurgitation. Click the esophagus to see a swallow.
Drag the slider bar to observe swallowing. When you have finished, click to continue. Drag the slider bar to observe swallowing. When you have finished, click to continue. The force generated by peristaltic contractions varies with the size of the bolus. Stimuli from the distension of the esophagus wall relayed to the central nervous system modify the pressure generated by the esophageal muscles. Larger boluses produce greater forces. A typical swallow propels a bolus of food through the esophagus to the stomach in about nine seconds. Liquids travel more rapidly than solids in the upright human. Water travels down the esophagus to the lower esophageal sphincter in about one second. Water enters the stomach five to eight seconds after the swallow, moves through the lower esophageal sphincter by the peristaltic wave. If a bolus of food does not progress all the way to the stomach, secondary peristalsis occurs. Click the esophagus to observe secondary peristalsis. When the esophagus is distended, afferent signals relayed to the central nervous system lead to a second wave of peristaltic contractions. Secondary peristalsis is common and is not felt by the subject. In summary, the type of motility in the esophagus is peristalsis. The function of esophageal peristalsis is to propel a bolus of food to the stomach. The stomach has several functions. It stores food, mixes food with gastric juice for digestion, and empties chyme into the duodenum. Different movements serve each function. The movements reflect the muscular structure of the stomach wall. Click the fundus to observe accommodation of a meal. Receptive relaxation occurs in the fundus and body of the stomach. Relaxation occurs with each swallow and permits the stomach to accommodate a volume of at least one liter with little increase in pressure. Peristaltic contractions mix stomach contents and empty chyme into the duodenum. Throughout the GI tract, the frequency of peristaltic contractions remains constant and is controlled by the interaction between pacemaker cells and smooth muscle cells. Each segment of the tract has a characteristic frequency. The frequency of gastric peristaltic contractions is 3 to 5 per minute. Click the body to observe peristalsis. Peristaltic waves begin mid-stomach, ripple over the body, and become stronger over the muscular antrum and pylorus. Antral contractions force chyme toward the duodenum and pulverize small lumps. Click the antrum to see gastric emptying. A small amount of chyme squirts through the constantly contracted pyloric sphincter with each powerful antral contraction. As the contraction progresses, it closes the sphincter completely, and most of the chyme is forced back into the stomach. This retropulsion effectively mixes food and gastric juice. Since frequency of peristaltic contractions is constant, the volume and contents of the stomach regulate the strength of contractions. In general, the greater the volume, the more rapidly the contents are emptied. The duodenum plays an equally important role in regulating gastric emptying. Fat, acid, and hypertonic solutions in the duodenum, as well as duodenal distension, slow gastric emptying. 
Fat is the most important stimulus for inhibiting gastric emptying. Fat is digested slowly, and the small intestine has to process it before additional chyme can enter. Acid must be neutralized to prevent damage to the intestinal wall and denaturation of digestive enzymes. Osmolarity must be slowly restored to normal before additional hypertonic chyme can enter. Distension inhibits gastric emptying until the excess duodenal volume can be handled by the small intestine. In summary, the stomach exhibits two types of motility. Receptive relaxation that functions to accommodate a meal and peristalsis that mixes and empties stomach contents.